The second kind of stigma that Jesus confronted that day was a gender stigma. This Samaritan person wasn't just a Samaritan. She was a woman. First of all, both in the Jewish, uh, Jewish context and the Samaritan context, women were just properties. First, they were properties of their parents, their father. And then there were properties of their husband. Their only purpose in life was to bear children. So much so that women were, in, were not counted when multitudes were counted. They were counted together with property, with animals. So and so had so many head of cows and two wives. That's how it was counted. So she had no other value being a woman other than her ability to produce and to bear children. There was a Jewish prayer, and they would stand and they would pray something like that. Thank God I was not born a slave, a Gentile, or a woman. Can you imagine living your life knowing that you were absolutely nothing but somebody's property? And the Jewish lawmakers, those religious lawmakers decided to help God a little bit. And what they did is that they declared, they came up with a new law, and they, the law said that a, a Samaritan woman was a perpetuous menstruous. In other words, she was unclean at all times. You're probably aware <coughs> that during the menstrual cycle of a Jewish woman, she was considered unclean, and not to be touched and put aside, and not to be uh, talked to, and, and unless you would be also unclean. The Jewish law would say the Samaritan woman was perpetuously unclean. How did Jesus respond to that? How does the gospel respond to that? Simply by acknowledging her humanity. Jesus looks at her and says, Give me water. What a surprise for that woman. She says to him, are you talking to me? Anybody saw that old movie, Taxi? If you didn't, don't watch it. So. But, <laughs> right? Where there's a scene, of, the scene where he's in the front of the mirror and goes, are you talking to me? Are you talking to me? That's, that's kind of the, the, the expression that the woman had, uh, uh, the surprise that she had when this Jewish man, Jewish and man, talking to her. Can you give me water? What Jesus does in that simple phrase is acknowledge you are a human being. I'm not better than you for being a man. I acknowledge your presence. I will talk to you. Where any other man or any other Jewish man would simply ignore her completely. Not even an eye contact. Jesus says, can you give me water? He acknowledges her humanity. Secondly, he acknowledges her value. I am at the well. There's water at the well. I am thirsty. But you have the one element I don't have. You have the ability to draw water from this well, which I cannot. In other words, you have value to me. There is something you have that I don't have. And I'm asking you for your gifts. I'm asking you to use what you have. He acknowledges her value and contribution. And then you also, at the end, entrust her with a message. Have you noticed that in this story, Jesus doesn't say, take me to your village so I can tell them what I told you? He doesn't do that. What does he do? He sends her. She goes into the village. She knocks on the door. She proclaims the gospel on her own. He entrusts her with the message. He could have followed her and said, hey, I am a man, I'm a Jewish man, I am a prophet, I'm going to talk, you're going to be quiet. No, he entrusts her. So all of a sudden, this 
woman who has no value begins to feel valued. I was in my office one day. This couple comes in, and the husband says to me, we have to bring a divorce. I've tried everything. The only thing I haven't tried is talk to a priest. So he thought I was a priest. Can you please help us? And I began to ask questions, and they, the woman was very quiet. She wouldn't say. Only after talking to her for a few hours, the story begins to come out. This, this girl, at the age of 14, had been given by her mother to her stepdad to bear child, children for the mother. Then the father, the stepfather, took off, took the girl, now 16, and kept her pretty much prisoner in her home, where he continuously abused her, tortured her. This man is in jail. It was a big deal. There was a story. It was all over the news in Winnipeg. And while she was going through all of that stuff, she was in our church. But she begins to tell us that she doesn't know what love is. She doesn't know because she never had it. So at age 18, she, she runs away. And the only thing she knows how to do is to have sex. So what does she do? She begins to sell her body for money. This man who she married was one of her Jones, but fell in love with her and began to treat her as a person and she just didn't know. He married her, but in the back of her mind, she was never valued. So she never knew what it is to be valued. Two years down the road, it's a day of baptism and she's being baptized. And she begins to read her story and she says, for the first time ever in this community of faith, I feel like I belong. I feel like I'm not below anybody. That I'm the same as anybody. Isn't that a beautiful story of restoring value? If you are to lead the church into the future, and I know, I just sense that God has leaders here that he's calling you to. He's going to need leaders that will look at people and restore their values through the power of the gospel. Because that's what Jesus came to do. Third, she had a lifetime lifestyle stigma. Jesus said, go get your husband. And she says, I have no husband. And he says, you said, right, you had five. The one you have is not yours. And at this moment, I'm reading the story. And at this moment, I said, Jesus, why do you say something like that? Things are going well with this woman. All of a sudden, now you're putting her down. What's going on with you? But he engages her in that conversation. She had a lifestyle statement. So much so that she avoided the other women that would come early in the morning to gather water because she was probably the gossip of the town. She was what everybody would talk about. So when you look at Jesus and you think, well, Jesus, what are you saying? She had five husbands. What, what's going on with you? She understood that. What I didn't understand at first until I started looking at divorce laws in the early days of Christianity or in, in, in the times of Jesus. Here's an interesting fact. Women could not divorce men. It was a man who divorced a woman. And they couldn't divorce a woman for the simple fact that she could not bear children. Or for the simple fact that they did not keep the house or look after the affairs the way that they wanted to, they could divorce them. So you can imagine that this woman now had been married five times, didn't start out, her story didn't start out as, I want to be divorced five times. She probably had the same dreams that every little girl ever had in their life. I want to find a husband. I want to give them lots of children, lots of boys, because that's what men wanted at the time. I want, I want us to prosper. She wanted all of these good things, but her story got interrupted somehow. Perhaps she couldn't bear children. 
So the first husband divorces her, the second one takes her and divorces, the third one takes her and divorces, the fourth one takes her and divorces her, the fifth one takes her and divorces her. How do you think she feels? What Jesus was saying to that woman at that moment is simply, I understand your story. I know where you're coming from. I know you didn't want to end up where you ended up. I know that you, th these are not the dreams you had for your life. I understand your path. If we are going to minister to people with what we call life, lifestyle types of stigmas, we have to get to a point where we understand their suffering, their pain, their story. Only from that place the gospel can speak truth. Only from that place the gospel can lead people to transformation. But if we sit in positions of accusation, well, you are like this because you're a sinful person. And if you only knew that you were not supposed to do this, if you only, if, if, we, if we sit in that place, we are never going to get to the point of understanding people's story. Jesus said, I understand your story. I get it. I get why you are right the way you are. And I finished with this. Jesus was also confronted with a religious statement. Who is right, Jesus? He said, the Jewish worship in Jerusalem, we worship in the mountains. Who is right? Which style? Which place? Who has got it? How does the gospel respond to it? It's by simply saying, hey, it's not about the place. It's not about the style. It's about this relationship with God. Come as you are, whatever information we have, whatever it means, come and have a relationship with God. And you and we must, as leader of the church, trust that Jesus can transform life without our help. Without our help. As we teach them, as we lead them, as we bring them to a relationship with God, He's capable of transforming lives. And this is what happens in this story. So she goes in, she brings people to Jesus, and they say to her, it's not what you have said anymore, but it's what we have heard. So I'm speaking to you as future leaders in Christ's church. The gospel has answers for every situation. Deep your, dip yourself into the gospel. Live yourself according to it. And you'll find yourself in a prosperous ministry. May the Lord bless you today.